You're listening to Tremendous Leadership with Dr. Tracy Jones. Hi, everyone. Why would anybody in their right mind want to jump on a sled and hurl down an icy mountain at over 80 miles per hour? You're about to find out. Our guest today on the Tremendous Leadership Podcast is Ruben Gonzalez. Ruben is the first person ever to compete in four Winter Olympics in four different decades. Incredible. He's a dear friend. He's known as the Luge Man. He's an author, a speaker, just all over the place. Incredible leader. And you are going to love listening to what Ruben has to say about what it takes to pay the price of leadership. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Tracy Jones. Thanks for tuning in to the Tremendous Leadership Podcast, Leaders on Leadership, where we pull back the curtain on leadership and talk with leaders all over the world about what it took them to pay the price of leadership. And today, I am so excited because I have a longtime friend, speaker, expert writer, athlete, Ruben Gonzalez. Let me tell you about Ruben. You're going to love hearing his perspective on the price of leadership. So at the age of 21, Ruben Gonzalez took up the sport of luge and started training for the Olympics. Four years and a few broken bones later, Ruben made his Olympic team dream come true. But he didn't stop there. Ruben kept training, and at the age of 47, I love it, he was racing against 20-year-olds at the Vancouver Winter Olympics. Respect for us middle-ager, Ruben. And then Ruben's the first person to ever compete in four four separate Winter Olympics in four different decades. All right, so no crying about you're too old to do this. He's one of the most popular speakers in America. Ruben's best-selling book, The Courage to Succeed, has been translated into 10 different languages. I know you're gonna love listening to this man. He is the genuine thing. He's just an awesome guy. He's adventurous, and I hope someday I can grow up to be half as tremendous as him. Ruben, thanks for being on my podcast. Oh, it's so good just to see you and hang out with you. Uh, we. Uh, I met your dad years ago. Um, I was on this uh, circuit called the, the the Get Motivated circuit, and Zig Ziglar was there, and and uh, Charlie Tremendous Jones, and all these great speakers. And I was just a total, total, totally green. I mean, I'd only been speaking for a couple of years, and this was to groups of three to five thousand people all, all over the place. And so um, the first time. It was somewhere in the south, Alabama, maybe it was Birmingham, I don't know. But there was, I can still picture the stage. It had all these red, white, and blue sashes. And this guy uh, walks up to me, this big, tall guy, and he grabs me in this big bear hug. And, and I don't want a man hugging me. And so I'm trying to pull out, but he's too strong, right? And he smacks a big old kiss on my face. I thought, man. <laughs> and so I, I, didn't, I didn't know what to say. And then when he went up on stage, because I was kind of stage left or stage right backstage, and then he walks in, he, he does his thing. I thought, oh, my gosh, I've never even heard of this guy. He's awesome. Yeah. And that was Charlie Tremendous Jones. And uh, as part of the price of leadership is, you know, b- before you have to lead, you have to follow, right? Mm. You have to follow other leaders. And so I was up there, uh, like I said, I was really green. And so I'm, try- I'm taking notes. I'm seeing, well, what does Charlie do? How does he, you know, who does he look at? Where does he, where does he stand? How does he put these, these stories together? How does he use pauses, right? In his, mm-hmm. in, in his stories, same thing with Zig, uh, I remember the first six times I spoke to these big groups. You can't see them. You have these huge lights, right? It's like a big Mack truck's about to hit you. <laughs> and, and I felt lost. I, I realized that I'm not connecting with the audience, and I realized I, I need that, right? Um, and I looked at Zig, and right before the seventh time, I noticed, for the first time, I noticed that he spent 75% of his time looking down at the first couple of rows because you could see those people right. and he could see their expression and he was feeding off of them, right? And then he would spend a few seconds looking up there. It was just it's a black spot, but just to connect right. to that group and then up there and up there. And then he'd go back here and feed off of that. That's how you do it. Yeah. And now I, I can speak to a million now because you just focus on those front two rows. So those are I little things it. that you pick up from your leaders, right? You have to yes. be hungry. And you have to be willing to, you know, first time I went to Lake Placid, uh, I'm 21 years old. I decided I'm going to take up the sport of luge. I live in hot and humid Houston, okay? There's not much luging going on down there. (laughs) I went to Lake Placid, but before I went, I said to myself, I don't know a thing. 
I'm going to be learning from the U.S. Olympic coaches. And so my attitude is whatever they say, I'm going to do. I'm going to right. humble myself to right. their leadership because who am I? To, you know, I don't know a thing. Right. Uh, and, and so that's what I did. And a couple of times they said things that totally didn't make sense, but I had made that promise to myself. I'm going to follow them. And if you do that long enough, and there's always somebody up there that's, you know, no matter how good you are, there's somebody up there that's better than you, okay? Um, so you might be top 10 uh, in the world, but you're not number one yet. And so so there's somebody you can learn from. And so that's, the, the, I, I'm always, uh, I tell people, I'm not a, <sighs> I'm like your neighbor, okay? I'm not a great athlete. I went to four Olympics. I I'm, I'm I made C's in English. I'm a best-selling author. I mean, not a real best-selling author, okay? 300,000 books sold over many years. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm a shy guy. I'm a professional speaker. Uh, nothing special about me. The only thing is I'm a really good soldier. I'm really good at finding the general. The person's already done what I want to do, wow. and I just listen to them. Right. And if you do that long enough, you learn. And then right. it, it, uh, Jack Canfield, he said that you just uh, had a program with him. One thing he told me was it doesn't matter where you are on the road to success, okay? If you're just getting on the bus and you're way on the back of the bus, you're not the driver yet, that's okay, you know? Because eventually you're going to work your way up. And you're, you're learning from, from the leaders and, and you're bringing other people up, right, and you're just a conduit, right, of the information, and that's what everybody's been doing forever, right? I mean, right. since the Bible, right? Well, I love that you brought that out because you know, and I just did my my research project was on followership because you know enough about the leaders, the person that that isn't that entry level or mid level, like you said, we have to have the wherewithal to be open and teachable and look at the leaders because otherwise they put it on the leaders and it's like no, you as a follower, be a sponge, be a soldier, get in there and just say, um, you know, the person up there is emulating and role modeling what you're doing, but they can't do it for you. And a lot of people are like, well, you know, they, they want to blame it on the leader. And I'm like, well, you, can't, you can't blame it on any. There are bad leaders out there, but once you, we don't follow them, okay? We're, 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 we're critical thinkers. We say, I don't want to follow this person. But Ruben, I got to ask you this. Why luge? Why the sport of luge? What, what, why did you pick out of all that, Houston boy? Hot, muggy Houston I was boy. <laughs> What, what I was born in Argentina. We're all soccer fanatics over there. Yes. I, I played soccer all my life. And, I'm, you know, you do anything long enough, you develop skills, right? You stay yes. in the game long enough, you develop skills. And then, so you have to stay in the, everything's tough at the beginning. I've told, I tell that to my kids ever <laughs> since they were yay high. You know, everything's tough at the beginning because you have no skills. You don't know what you're doing. So you stay in the game. You listen to the leaders, listen to your coach, and, and you'll get skills. And then you use the skills to reach the goal, the dream, right? And so I have good skills with the soccer, but I'm a slow poke, okay? I'm all slow twitch, and I'm not a great athlete. And so even though I had good – I was good with the soccer ball, I wasn't fast enough – other guy always got it first. I was still on the bench. It was very frustrating. <laughs> and so when I was 10 years old, I saw the Olympics on TV and I was hooked and I knew right away, that's my dream. That's what I want to do. But I didn't believe it's possible because I'm on the bench even for kickball. Okay. I wouldn't get picked for anything. I mean, this is not false modesty. This is how it was. And when I was 21, I'm watching the Olympics on TV. I see Scott Hamilton, the figure skater. Right. He's about five feet tall, 110 mm -hmm. pounds, soaking wet. Mm -hmm. This little 18 year old kid wins the gold medal in figure skating, right? And I thought, he gave me hope. I thought, if that little guy can win, I can at least play. I'm going to be in the next Olympics no matter what. It's a done deal. I just got to find a sport. Well, my. I knew that I had to put together a plan for the next four years and probably would base, you know, basing the plan on my strengths would probably be a smart thing to do. Right. <laughs> so my nickname in high school was bulldog. Cause I was very tenacious. I don't quit. All right. That's, that's a beautiful my, trait. That's, That'll get that's you 99% of life. Is that tenacity? Yeah. Amen. You know, yeah. and, uh, and I'm reading this book now called talent is overrated. Right. Yep. And it's yep. true. You know, uh, hard work trumps talent when right. talent doesn't work hard, right? right. And right. so if your attitude is I'm going to outwork competition and I'm just going to follow my coaches, you know, you get it eventually, right? Yeah. It might be slow, but, you know, turtles pa pass those hairs a lot in real life. They really do. And so... So um, you're the bulldog, and, and then how did this get to 
Well, no, I went to the library. Boy. I see Scott Hamilton. I get all excited. I went to the library. I got me a big book about the Olympics. I got to find a sport. I'm looking at the summer sports. It took me five minutes to realize you got to be a super athlete to do any of this stuff. No way. Now I'm looking at the winter sports. And as I'm looking at that list, I thought, I got to base my plan on my strengths. My strengths, perseverance. I'm bulldog. I got to find a sport. Uh, it's got so many broken bones. It's so tough. It'll be a lot of quitters, right? <laughs> Only I won't quit. I'll make it to the top on the attrition rate. That's my whole, oh. my whole plan, okay? I want to outlast these suckers. It's a plan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do something hard, right? There's less competition up there. And so ski jump, bobsled, luge. I had it down to those three. I lived in Houston. I never skied before. No way I'm doing ski jump. That's suicide. Oh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> bobsled. Flying through the air. You know, yeah. Who are you going to find three other nuts that want to do the bobsled, right? I mean, <laughs> you're Jamaica for that, right? <laughs> so, uh, in fact, you know Devin, Devin Harris? Yes. You know him? Have you had him on your show? No, I have not. That is gr- – okay. You need to call, call him up. He's great. Devin Harris is one of the original Jamaican bobsledders. He's a okay. Speaker. He lives in New York. Great guy, okay? Um, so – so that left the luge, right? And I'd never seen the luge on TV at that point in my life. I just had a little picture of a guy on a luge. I thought, you know, hey, that looks pretty tough. That's the one for me. Uh, thank God I never saw the luge because I probably wouldn't. I would have been too scared to try it. Right. But I went to – I wrote Sports Illustrated a letter, right? Because I didn't know. Where, where's the track, right? I didn't know anything. And my dad always said, you know, if you've got to cross a minefield, and you'll have to cross my, lots of them in life, you know, probably makes sense to follow somebody that already crossed it, right? Preferably somebody that's still walking. (laughs) So find the coach, find the mentor, right? So I wrote Sports Illustrated and I asked them, where do you go learn how to luge? And they actually wrote back and they said, Lake Placid, New York. Oh my God. And they sent me this picture. See this picture? This is right out of their magazine. See, that's where the staples went. It's all yellow because that's, that's, that's tape. As soon as I got that picture, I put it in this frame. Okay, this is 30, 40 years old almost. And that picture went right in front of my bed. And the first person I saw in the morning when I woke up was the luge man. He reminded me, hey, I'm going for the Olympics. I better eat right, hang around winners, read good books, okay? See, see, leaders are readers, okay? We're eternal learners. And so, um, we're, you know, <laughs> I'm competing against myself in life, okay? Right, and, right. and the better I become by reading all these books, right? <laughs> the better chance or probability that I'll reach my goals. There's no, no guarantees in life, right. right? But I've just increased my probabilities. And so I got to eat right. I hang, got to hang around winners, right? It's who, you know, people you, you know, books you read, people you hang around with, right? right? Well, where, where have I heard that before? <laughs> and so he, he kept me focused. At night, before I shut off the lights, Last person I saw was the luge man. So I was dreaming about the luge in the Olympics. All the time. He kept me going. Now, I want you to notice something. This guy, I didn't know it at the time, but he's not even very good. His feet are not pointed. His head's way up. He got three air brakes right there. Look at that. Look, yes. look at that, uh, that, that suit. It's all raggedy. Yeah, he's been in a lot of crashes. This guy's a newbie, right? But that was my picture of the luge man, okay? And he kept me going. That was my goal-setting system. And by doing that, by following him, a few years later, I became that guy. See? That's at the Salt Lake City Olympics. Oh Head's a little high, high, okay? At least I'm pointing my toes. Uh, no raggedy, not too much. And so, so you, know, you, you learn. You learn from other people. And, yeah. And you try to become – um, from, um, from reading Benjamin Franklin's biography – you know, he, he talked about cherry pick, cherry pick attitudes and traits and, uh, you know, good things from, from people that you admire. And so that's what I do. I'm always trying to learn from everybody, right? Right, and right. Somebody told it. me if I, if, if I read everything in this book, this is a really good book, by the way. Yes, okay? it is. If I read everything in this book and I write a book and I start copying stuff out of that book, you know what that's called? Plagiarism, right? Right. No good. I'll get you into trouble. But if I read all of these books <laughs> and I pick up ideas and yeah. then I use stories from my own life, that's not plagiarism. I'm right. copying from everybody, but it's right. not plagiarism. You know what it's called? It's called research. Yeah. yeah I, yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's what I do. I, I, I just it. copy from everybody. Student for and, life. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. 
Well, tell me, okay, so Ruben, tell me, now that I know how you wound up there, I, I, I love that. Okay, so dad talks about the price of leadership, and you know this, and um, he talks about, the he always spoke on leadership, and he was known as a motivator, but he was also very pragmatic. He's like, here's your highs, here's your lows. You're going to go back and forth, can't quit, um, but you got to stay the course. So no wonder you guys loved each other so much. Gosh, and I'm so glad he grabbed you and kissed you. I just, I would have. It's just, I hear that a lot. That's awesome. He wouldn't have done good in COVID, but soon we'll be hugging and kissing. Uh, so it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, thank you, God, that he's in heaven. But he talks about in the price of leadership, there's four things you got to pay before you're a leader. And I'd, I'd love to get your reflections on this from any stage of your life, whether it's as a speaker, a writer, or an athlete competing in four separate Olympics in four separate. I mean, Ruben, that's incredible. And, and talk to me about loneliness. Um, you know, we hear it's lonely at the top and people are like, yeah, I don't want to be the boss because then I can't hang out with anybody. It's lonely. But, um, you know, even Jesus was lonely. You know, he had his time alone in the garden. And so can you talk mm. to me what that means for you as a leader, how you cope with loneliness? Um, and where you went through a season of it, what you learned from it, and maybe just a word of exhortation to some of our listeners that may be in a season of loneliness. Yeah, I know, I know these days it's tough for uh, extroverts because they like to be around people. I'm, truly, I'm an introvert, so it's, yeah. it's, not, it's not affecting me as much, right? And we homeschool our kids, so we didn't have to figure out how to do that. Okay. Um, we homeschool our kids from day one. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. You, my recipe for success is you got to be willing to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes to get the job done. All right. No excuses, no excuses, whatever it takes for as long as it takes. Now that, what that means, it doesn't mean you step on other people. You know, you got to be, you know, moral, legal, and ethical because you can't, you, you, you got to think long-term, right? If, if, if your, if your goals are long-term, really long-term, then your day-to-day -day decisions are really easy, right? Because when somebody, when I was going for the Olympics, if somebody offered me this big chocolate cake, it was like, mm, chocolate cake, Olympics, chocolate cake, uh, I'll take the Olympics. It was easy, right. right? Right. But when I'm not going for an Olympics, boy, it's tough to make that decision. I'm goal-oriented. I'm going to eat the whole cake. So, <laughs> so whatever it takes, as long as it takes. Now, when I first called Lake Placid, and I told him, I'm, I'm an athlete here in Houston. I want to learn how to lose. So I'm in the Olympics in four years. Four years. Will you help me? The guy starts laughing. He says, you're 21? No way, man. We start him off with they're 10 years old. By now, you should have 10 years experience. And he's just saying, no. I thought they're going to welcome me. He's laughing in my dream. Yeah. I didn't know what to do. All right? Uh, only thing I knew was hanging up is not an option. If I hang up the phone, it's all over. All right? And so I just had, kept him talking. I thought, I got to keep him on. I got to create some rapport. I got to think of something. And my leader friends, I, uh, my dad always said, who are you going to hang around with? You become like the people you hang around with. He says, you want to hang around people that are successful, people that are always going places. You know, you, you don't hang around people that, 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 that are not there yet. These are whiners, complainers, you know, that they'll infect your attitude and they have the, and they have the power to steal your dream. All right. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. have to protect your attitude. So you got to hang around winners. You, you'll feel um, awkward. You'll feel like you don't belong. You'll feel, uh, you know, uh, you know, you, you won't even feel right approaching them. But force yourself to do it because if you do, you'll you'll become like them. You'll pick up their habits, right? Sure. And I tell people the the easiest and the best diet in the world is you want to lose ten pounds. You know what you do? You just start hanging around some skinny people. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You don't even notice yes. it. You'll be riding bikes and walking and eating salad, and you'll be happy because you pick up their habits, and wow. the, the, the pounds will come off because right. you become like that, right? Right. And so he says, hang around those people, and and I did, and what I noticed was that they think differently. They, they're always focusing on the dream. They don't focus on the obstacle. There's always going to be an obstacle. But they focus on the dream because the yeah. dream gives you strength and power and energy, all those things you need to bust through those obstacles, right? And they ask themselves different questions. Why not me? Why not now? Why not? Those are questions that, that get your subconscious mind, you know, looking for an answer, right? And so, and when they get knocked down, they realize that winners don't have the luxury to wallow in their misery. As soon as you walk, get knocked down, you got to get yourself back up, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you do, uh, if you stay down there, you lose all your momentum, right? You're working really hard. You hit a wall, boom. Now you got to get right back up, right? Mm -hmm. And, and they, they would tell me things like, you know, when you hit that wall, immediately say to yourself, there's always a way, there's always a way, there's always a way. 
you know, this, God always give me a way. If I don't quit, I'll find that way. So, so now I'm looking for that instead of, you know, I got a boxer friend. You got a Don Akers, write down his name. You got to have him on your show. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, Don Akers. Um, uh, he says, look, uh, boxer, he gets knocked down. You got 10 seconds to get back up. If you wait 11 seconds, you lost the fight. Yeah. So from now on, if you're listening Great. to this, you're yeah. an honorary boxer. Okay. Yeah. None of us. We're winners. We can't afford to stay down. Okay. Wow. No, life knocks you down. You get right back up and then you right. still got some of that momentum. You don't have to work as hard to, you know, to keep going. So when I, when I first called this guy, he's trying to talk me out of it. He says, man, there's no way you're too old. You know, if you want to do it in just four years, it's going to be brutal. We're going to have to compress 10 years of training into just two years because the last two years you got to be competing in the world cup circuit against the best in the world to get these world cup points. Cause right before the Olympics, they tally everybody up and top 50 get to go 51 watching on TV. So you go, you know, where you go. I said, yeah, of course I'll go. I'll do whatever it takes, right? But I'm so glad he didn't candy coat it. A real leader will not candy coat it that. to their people, you right? Know. You know, he could have said, oh, yeah, come on down. You know, we've got a camp. And no, he told me, you're going to break some bones, okay? We're going to compress. You're going to get hurt a lot, okay? And I'm so glad he told me because that gave me the opportunity to put, put on some mental armor. I knew it was going to be hard. I knew it was going to be like going to war. So I started thinking, okay, you know, one of the things my leader of friends, my dream team, they would say is, you know, you have to have contingency plans. Okay. What's uh, you got to you hope for the best, but prepare for the, for the worst. Mm -hmm. So, so I thought, okay, well, what's the worst that going to happen? Well, this guy just said, I'm probably going to break some bones. Okay. Well, how am I going to handle it? What am I going to do if I break a bone? I thought about it. I thought, Hey, 40 days later, it's healed up. It's actually stronger than before. So when mm -hmm. you think about it, broken bones, temporary inconvenience, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's how I framed it. A broken bone is a temporary inconvenience. If I break a bone, I'm going to come back. So I go, they put me in a class with 15 guys, and some of these guys are quitting because they got a bruise, okay? Maybe they didn't want it as badly as I want it. Yeah, I think they just didn't so. think about it's going to be tough, yeah. right? Right. And so, and they had all these reasons for quitting. Oh, it's too expensive. Oh, it's too far away. Oh, I miss my family. Oh, I don't like the lose. <laughs> I hated the luge, okay? I was killing myself out there. But the luge was the vehicle. The Olympics was the dream. I okay. focus on the dream. Okay, see? love it. See? Yep. First seven years, I missed seven Christmases in a row, okay? Because there was a little Christmas break between Christmas and New Year's, but it didn't make sense. If I wasn't, you know, halfway around the world training, it didn't make sense. I couldn't afford it. You know, and every penny I saved was more time I was going to get to train. Mm -hmm. So I missed seven Christmases. That was kind of lonely, right? Mm -hmm. But you just focus on the dream again. I remember right. one time I was in Calgary. I was staying at this friend's house. Luckily, I found a place to stay during those two weeks. And they had left. They had left for two weeks to go see their family. And I was in the apartment by myself. And I remember spending all Christmas Day with, with, uh, you know, with sew sewing all the holes in my Loose suit, right? Because it was full of holes at, at, at that point from all my crashes. But I wasn't feeling sorry for myself. Right. I was just, right. you know, it's not, each of these is making me faster, right? Because my, I'm going to be more aerodynamic. It's not going to be all raggedy doing this. <laughs> so, so it's what you focus on. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And your dream then becomes your, um, your partner. You know what I'm saying? So you can focus on that. I love that. Somebody else said, a, a guy I interviewed last week said, well, your values, you may be alone physically, but as long as you have your values and as you would say that dream, that, that will accompany you um, so you know. And I think intrinsically then we know that this season of loneliness is going to be for right now. You know what I'm saying? Because now you're it's not lonely. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's a season. It's a season. It's a season. Right, but you got to go through that season because people are going to be on the luge with you training. They're not going to be giving up their Christmas. This is your road to walk. And so you may have to walk it all. And that, that doesn't mean you're doing something wrong as a leader. It just, it, it may be the season that you have to. So uh, I love that. And I love that you just didn't sit there. And, uh, you know, I remember being in the military, people would be like, oh, you're way over the holidays. I'm like, yeah, we signed up for the military. <laughs> <laughs> We got to be tough. Yeah, we got to be tough. What? Don't feel sorry for me. I mean, this is this is what we we wanted to do. I can't stand people that complain. Yeah. I, don't, I mean, not I, in America. I, it's a free country. It turns me it's, off. It's life. Do something else. Yeah. It turns me off. You know, I I just don't want to be around them. It's I like know. yuck. You know, you can't. It's like in uh, um uh what's that uh, George Bailey? Remember George Bailey and It's a Wonderful Life? Oh yeah. Um, 
when he is losing everything, right? He's about to, you know, right before he's going to jump off that bridge mm -hmm. and he goes to, to Mr. Potter, the guy that owns everything, the, the bad guy. And Mr. Potter offers him, you know, like triple his, his salary if he'll manage his stuff. And he, ha he, he shakes his hand and he looks at his hand and he's like, yuck, you know? It's like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to work for you. And he just runs off. Yeah. And I get that yuck factor when, I, when, pe when people whine and complain, you know? Because I want to slap them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Zig, Zig would call them um, sniops, sensitive to the negative influences of other people. Yeah, I hear it and I'm like, no, 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 no. I ain't got time. Miss Tracy ain't got time for this. Save it. Go. Social media is full of that stuff. You guys want to dump and vent? Please go over there. Yeah, it's ugh, icky, icky. Okay. <laughs> you know, fo what you focus is huge. Uh, before my fourth Olympics, I was... I just decided, hey, I'm, let's see if this old body can do it again, right? I was 40, well, I was about 45 when I got started training, and it was just, and I rushed it. I wish I hadn't, but it was a last minute thing, and so I, I did two seasons to try to break into it. And this coach uh, for, for the American team, uh, he, we become great friends. Somebody else you need to have on your show, actually. Okay. Uh, Jonathan Edwards. And he's actually a descendant of the Jonathan Edwards that used to be a, a big preacher. Uh -huh. uh, Jonathan said, um, he, he said, I can't believe you're still scared on that sled after 25 years doing this. I mean, what's going on in your head when you're going down the slide, sliding down that luge? And I said, man, it's those walls go faster and faster. I get tighter and tighter by the bottom of the track. I'm surprised I can even steer. I'm so stiff. And he said, Ruben, luge is not even about speed. I said, what? He goes, no, it's, we're surrounded by speed, but it's about time. It's about who has the best time. You could be clocked at the fastest speed, but if you crash at the bottom of the track, you lost the race, okay? So don't focus on the speed. You need to focus on, you, you know, put on blinders like a horse, Okay. Next time you go, and you're uh, you're gonna focus on not on the speed. You're gonna focus on what do I need to do on every section of every curve? How do I need to steer in order to assure that I'm gonna have the best line that'll give me the best time? Okay. And if you do that, basically we're, we we lose about 30 feet of that track at a time. Okay. That's how that's how we do it. If you do that, the fear will disappear. Man. And I trust him. He was number fourth in, in the Little Hammer Olympics. He, he understands how the, he can get in my head, right? And so uh, that night, I took about a, a hundred luge runs, mental, right? We call them mind runs, uh, visualizing, you know, going down the, and with, the, with the blinders on. Next day, I get on the track, fear disappeared. It didn't reduce. It disappeared. Changing wow. the focus changed everything, okay? Man. And so... What's everybody focusing on? Oh, COVID, you know, and oh, the economy's terrible, and I don't know what to do, blah, blah, blah. And they're whining, whining. No, no. COVID is the same. You know, that's speed, okay? We all got COVID, all right? So right. that's the environment we're in right now. You need to focus on what do I need to do in the next 15 minutes to move my business forward? Who do I need to talk to? Oh, but nobody's buying now. Fine, they may not, but you can strengthen those relationships by right. touching base with everybody. Hey, how's it going, blah, blah, And then when things change, you positions yourself. They remember you, you're top of mind. And now uh, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. This is a tough time, okay? And you know what tough times bring? It's a shakedown, baby. A lot of people are going to go out of business. But we we're not going to go out of business because we're the winners. Right. Sheep from the goat, boys from the men. It's yeah. great pruning. This is the great pruning. It's a pruning time. Oh, I yes. love it. Oh, and pruning I'm is use that. there was a lot of dead disease or dying. Well, I was in my devotions this morning about, you know, our father is the tree and we're the mines. And if we ain't producing, we're not fruitful. The pruning time. It is. It yeah. is, you know. But you I started that. speaking professionally in 2002, okay? Yeah. I was a copier salesman. I uh, sold copiers in downtown Houston. I knocked on, when you look at the picture of downtown Houston, I've knocked on every door of every floor of every building downtown Houston several times. So copiers and paper shredders, okay? Only building you can ever get in was Enron. <laughs> and we always wondered what's going on in there, yeah. right? And, and we tried, you know, we figured, hey, if you can sell a copier in Enron, you know, that proves you're the best in the world. Hey, they just walk us out. It was like trying to get through TSA. <laughs> and I was wondering what's going on in there. And when I found out, I thought, oh my gosh, I could have sold them a million bucks worth of shredders. Darn. <laughs> But I was doing that, and this is right before the Salt Lake City Olympics, 2002. Right before I go for the Olympics in February, this kid in my neighborhood, little kid, he says, hey, Ruben, when you come back from the Olympics, will you be my show and tell project in school? 
I said, sure, why not? That picture show and tell when I was a kid, you know, 20, 30 kids, everybody's got to show something, you know, five minutes, right? Just to get them to talk about something. I thought five minutes, I'll be in and out of there, right? But man, I'm no prisoners. I'm finally going to win a gold medal. I'm going to kill, right? <laughs> I'm competing against these. And mentally, I thought I'm going to kill these. So I took the sled, the helmet, the Olympic torch. Well, I get to the school. The principal takes me to the cafeteria. They call it the auditorium, right? Because that's where they had their little gate. There's 200 kids sitting on the floor. He says, you got 45 minutes. Have at them. Yeah. I thought I was going to die. Okay. Oh. That door looks so inviting. <laughs> I said a little prayer. I mean, yeah. I said, God, what do I do now? Right. right. It's a desperation prayer. And what I felt I needed to do was, I never heard God talk to me. Okay. Let's get this straight. But he's put thoughts in my mind. Right? He's put feelings in my heart. Right. And what I felt I needed to do was just tell him your story, give him some pointers to help him reach their goals and dreams. And I did. Uh -huh. And afterwards, the principal said, you're better than people we pay. You need this for a living. He's going on and on. And I said, what? You get paid for show and tell? He says, no, it's a speaking profession. Don't you know anything? I quit my job three days later. I thought I can sell a copy or I can sell a Ruben too. I don't recommend it, okay? Bad, <laughs> bad approach. Somehow we made it through, but I didn't know. I decided to quit. And this is three months after 9-11, right? The speaking business had just dropped because right. it was just like now. Nobody was traveling. Nobody was meeting. I was afraid they're going to get blown up. Right. And that's when I decided to become a, a speaker. <laughs> yeah. And in 2008, it was a big pruning time too, right? right. 2008, everything right. went down. But it, you just make a decision. As soon as COVID came, and I'm telling you guys, this is not about me, okay? I just want you to, you know, as I'm telling you these stories, I want you to pull out principles that, that how can I apply some of this stuff? You know, otherwise, just entertainment, okay? Right. But right. as soon as COVID hit, about six months ago, all, I mean, all of the meetings started getting canceled, right? And I was, uh, I'll be honest, I was deer in the headlights for about two days. And then I realized, hey, you know, I, I got a mastermind. So I started calling a few of my speaker friends and, hey, let's meet on Zoom twice a, a week at least. And let's just throw mud on the wall. Some of it's going to stick. You know, let's make all the mistakes we can. You know, we can clean up the mess later. But let's make as many mistakes and then let's, let's get back and, you know, best practices. Let's share. Let's try to figure this thing out. And we figured it out, right? And, and heck, the volume's not nearly as, as high as it was before. But we got we we got this uh, Zoom and this uh, 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 virtual uh, presentation things sure. down pat now. Right. And so when things normalize, it's going to be better than before because now there's there's still going to be a place for Zoom meetings. Yeah. You know, maybe every quarter you bring in a speaker and and nobody has to leave work, right? right. It's very cheap, and you they still get them up. Right. You still got to bring them in once a year, you know, because you need that networking. You need to right. feel each other. Right. But but it's going to be better in the long run. See, that's it what is. I'm focusing on. It's going to be better because it if is. I just think about how it is right now, then I'm just going to get all depressed. I'm, you know, it'll stop, right? I'll, right? I'll stop doing what I need to do. So it's all an attitude thing. It is. It is. It is. Okay, so weariness. Obviously, how do you cope with weariness as a leader? How do you stay refreshed? Obviously, you've been in physically, I mean, you don't get, get without, you know, get to be in the Olympics and compete without, you know, going the extreme of your body. Or like you said, even, even with your business, even just growing your speaking business, I can remember my dad telling me stories of how he'd sleep on the floor in train stations because he couldn't afford a hotel. He'd hawk books out of the back wow. of his car. Wow. I mean, he was, really? he was just relentless, but it was tiring. H how do you stay... Um, refreshed Ruben how do you how do you stay and I know you talked about people in books that that's the surest way to do it but can you share with us how how you really take care of it you have to figure out right know thyself right so you have to figure yes. out what what refreshes you right Beautiful. for me it's riding the bike right or going on a hike you know even if it's a one-hour hike right it's just you just see God's glory everywhere it's like man this is awesome yeah. and, and you get some good ideas you know invariably when I go ride the bike for an hour you get the blood flowing, right? To parts of the brain that wasn't getting enough blood before. And you get all these ideas, right? So you're not wasting an hour. You're actually coming back with some great ideas. Some people, you know, hey, maybe they want to play the guitar. Maybe that yeah. gets them all excited, right? You know, maybe it's reading a book. Maybe it's, uh, it could be anything, right? Playing with your dog or playing catch with your kids. Uh, I, it's funny. I read something years ago about Thomas Edison, you know, he had all these patents, right? And he was so, so uh, productive, right? Well, what can we learn about productivity 
what can I cherry pick from Thomas Edison? Mm -hmm. And one thing he did it was he would work on one project for 90 minutes with nothing, just one thing for 90 minutes. He wouldn't even check his emails, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and with no interruptions. And then he could take a break. And I, yes. I've actually been to, to where he who, yes. where his office was, right? Uh, and, and he had a little lake, and his thing was fishing. You know, he'd just sit out there, and whether he caught anything, that was his refresh, right? Yes. And he would bring people. as a little path. you walk and go fish, and then you come back, and you get back to work on 90 minutes on something else. Yes. And so we homeschool our kids. And so ever since they were little, I trained them. I told them, look, I need at least three or four of these 90-minute chunks a day, okay? If I can get three or four of those, I had a great day. And so I'm going to work for 90 minutes on something. And then we're going to play, all right? Whatever you want to do for 20 or 30 minutes, whatever you do, I'm yours. And then I got another, I, but I, no interruptions because I got another 90 minute. And that's how we did it. I love it. And it works. I it love works. it. Absolutely. So don't check your emails. Don't multitask. Yeah. Multitask, no, it's no good. I know. And, and you know what? That brings us to the next point, which is abandonment. And, and I love what, what, you know, abandonment is like, oh, are you abandoning? It's like, no, dad really taught, that was that, that hyper focus. You need to focus on what you need and ought to think about in favor of like thinking about chocolate cake. No, you like, you already hit on it, but I love that. And, and talk to me more. Do you have any other tips? That 90 minute thing, that's absolutely brilliant boundaries and let your kids know I'll be to you in this, but um, what else do you do to stay very focused on your next goal, Ruben? I don't make all these goal lists. Uh, I, one thing that I do though, is I know what my goal is, my long-term goal. Yeah. And I write it down. You have to write it down every day. Okay? Yes. Oh, why do I have to write it down? I already know what it is. Well, no, because writing no. it down is an act of commitment. It, right. it, it goes into your subconscious mind if you have, a, and don't do it on the typewriter, okay? Grab a pencil. Maybe this pencil can last you for 10 years if that's all you do, right? <laughs> there you go. Uh, whatever down. people are talking, I'm like, rip, rip, rip. yeah. And that's how it I retain it. It could be a it. phrase. It could be, right. you know, it could be, uh, you know, five and five. You know, that's, that's mine. The one, and I know what that means. And, uh, and I write it down. And now my day has focus, right? Because right. now everything I'm doing is to help me reach that goal. And, um, you know, uh, I know you went to the Air Force Academy. I'm just, uh, I love it. You know, we live about 10 miles away from the Air Force Academy. And um, our son wants to go there. And so he's right reading this book, book you know, he, he wanted to make money, right? And uh, to, to build, because he builds our RV uh, re remote control, RC planes, uh, it builds them, designs them. Okay. And then he builds them. Then he flies them. I mean, this kid's amazing. I don't even change you all my car. And this kid built planes from scratch. But <laughs> after he, when he got into, started getting into the RC, uh, he crashed a couple of these hundred dollar planes. I said, man, you're going to have to figure out a way to make money because I'm not going to be paying for this, this thing anymore. And so he, he was looking for things to do. I said, well, you know, besides mowing the lawn, doing stuff around the house, what else can I do? I says, okay, well, see those books over there? <laughs> and I, cop I, I, I got this idea from your dad, actually. Uh, he, um, we did the exact same thing. I told him, okay, those are all personal development and leadership books. Pick what you want, you know, and read them and write a one-page report. And it doesn't have the, I don't even care that it's written right. I just want you to give me some takeaways, all right? What did you learn from this? And then together... We're going to write, figure out, uh, you know, we'll write a book out of it. We're going to write a book out of it. He actually, he loves your book about the millennials. He just, he, that's one of his Yeah, favorites. he read that and gave <laughs> me feedback on that too. Yeah. Yeah. And so he just read one about, um, uh, let's see, look, he, he just handed me these reports yesterday. Yeah, I know you know these people. Um, Jimmy Doolittle's biography he read, I Could Never Be So Lucky Again. Awesome biography if you've never read it. Wow. Uh, and then Billy Mitchell. Crusader for Air Power. Oh, He's yeah. Like a couple names so I know. A report. Yeah. And so we're writing a book, and the book's going to be called The Launching Pad. Because it's going to, and then we're going to, you know, it's all about leadership. So guess who's going to get the first edition of this book? All these congressmen, all these people that need to recommend him to go to the Air Force Academy, right? We're going to try to tip the scales. Uh, and, and hopefully he'll, you he'll, know, he'll, he'll, he'll make his dream come true. He wants to fly and design airplanes. He wants to be an aeronautical engineer. I love so it. see how it's the same principles, though? Uh, ever it since is. they were little, right? I've, I've read and you know I've learned this from you know you you read uh, somebody famous uh, um, their their biography right and, you, and it's very common where their kids are screwed up because uh, uh, they try to push their kids to try to do the same thing 
and I messed them up. And I've always told my kids, look, and people ask me, you know, you want your kids to be Olympians? I tell them I couldn't care less. You know, I, they got to figure out what their Olympics is. And it doesn't even have to, it doesn't even have, to um, uh, have anything to do with sports. You could be an Olympic teacher. You could be an Olympic um, uh, restaurant owner. You could be an Olympic, uh, you know, uh, engineer, right? So you figure out what your Olympics is, and I'll help you with the process. I'll help you get around the people that, you know, that you can cherry pick from. But right. don't try to be like me. Right. Because right. you're not like me. You're just half like me. <laughs> right. right. Well, I love the fact that you talked about your and how old is he now? He's your 15. Boy. OK. So, you know what? A lot of people say, well, 15 year olds are just sitting there um, fiddle farting around on social media or on their phones or video games. That's all they do. <laughs> no, that's not all, all of them do. I know quite a few that don't do that, you know, and they have to get learn abandonment and focus on vision. Um, it, it, you can pick that up at any stage of your life. At any age. Look, look at all these planes yeah. here. See? Yeah. Wow. I had to make this rack because really this place is Man. ridiculous. This is, yeah, this is our mechanical room. I've never shown my mechanical room at an, a podcast, but uh, built here's some, crooky, some of my books, right? This is what a speaker's garage looks like, a bunch of unsold yeah. books. <laughs> <laughs> but he says, I need more place to work, Dad. So we, during COVID, we built and designed these desks for him. We did oh, it together, my. right? Yeah. And, he he writes code. This kid's so smart. He um he's got um uh, this thing is a three D printer. He, we bought it, you know, and it was like five hundred bucks. He bought it right with some of the stuff that he that, that he made, uh, the money he made from reading all those books. And then he took it all apart and he upgraded it. He goes, oh no, now it's ten times faster and it makes less noise. I said, oh my gosh, you got to work on my car. And so uh, more more planes over there. These are Olympic torches. Some of my stuff, right? And, uh, and, when, and we play ping pong too, you know, ping pong is a good thing. You know what ping pong does? It gets both sides of the brain working, you know, oh. going for a walk is good too. It yes. gets, you know, uh, cause it gets both sides working. Right. So now you get more ideas. That's why I get ideas when I'm riding the bike right. because oh, uh, all these yeah. thoughts are starting to crisscross. Right. See? Right. So, um, but, um, Oh, look, this is stuff that he built with his AutoCAD. I mean, he, he, he takes, he designs engines with an AutoCAD and then he, Builds them on this. I mean, geez, if he didn't get into the Air Force Academy, I don't know. Oh, they're, no, they're he, I think it. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow, that's incredible. Oh, my yeah, God. But see how uh, I'm not sure I'm bragging on my kid, right? But what I'm trying to show through that story is that these are principles that we're just passing on, right? Right. 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 All stages and all ages. This is universal. And you know what? That's you read a book. Right. When I, when I was a kid, my dad got me to read books. He said, um, if you'll study the lives of great people, you'll figure out what works and what doesn't work in life because success leaves clues. He says, read biographies, right? And he's a chemical engineer. And he knew I had no interest in that. He says, don't read. He could have easily, most people could have easily uh, pushed me into reading all these engineering books. And that would have just repelled me from the books. He says, no, read about anybody that you like because the principles are the same in every right. arena, right? And so read about them. And so I read about, you know, race car drivers and athletes, and I like military, so I love Patton. And so I, um, I, I read that. And, and then in college, I discovered how to win friends and influence people. That was my first personal development book. I thought, oh my gosh, there's 10 times as many principles in this. I don't have to fish for them because they're all over the place. So I read, you know, see you at the top and, and all these, all these, all these uh, classics, right? Um, and, uh, the Magic of Thinking Big, all these great books. But the funny thing is you read a book that was written in the 60s and they reference a book that was written in the 30s and they reference a book that was written in you know, the 1800s. Right. And you keep going back, you know where right. you end up? You always end up in the same place. Proverbs. Right, Proverbs. <laughs> yeah. I read one proverb a day. And my, those that listen to this know, 31 Proverbs every day, uh, five Psalms and one prop. Greatest leadership book of all time. Want to know there anything about leadership? Raising kids, taking care of animals, sluggards, <laughs> fools. You know, it's like, it's in Proverbs. Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, he was wise. So wise. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, Solomon. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. All right. So, so okay. So Ruben, abandonment, and thank you for sharing that. No matter what age, um, you can really get into. Um, uh, you know, and like you said, your father started started that trend. Dad was the same way too. He's like, you read books, but this is the kind of books you're going to read: personal development or a biography or an autobiography. You know, not not um, now. C.S. Lewis, he'd let me slip in every now and then for a little his uh, <laughs> fantasy or science fiction. But you know, the and that screw the tape letters is amazing. He was so smart to understand how people really thought. You know, unbelievable. And so loved him and stuff like and Tolkien. You know, any of the, the it was <laughs> Christian fiction or something like that that I got to slip him in. But talk to me about vision and and what does vision mean for you because i mean I, I think sometimes and i love that you shared really who you really are and who and and just and that was dad i mean just just flanked out of school in the eighth grade. i mean he was who he was he was so humble but yet i think we look at some people and go wow they're visionaries they were born with like an extra lobe in their brain or something <laughs> they, they see things that i can't see it's like no he would always say vision is just seeing what needs to be done and doing it and you have alluded mm. to that this not alluded you have specified that this whole time you knew where you want to go and you went for it you made it and you made it yours and you worked it because nothing works dad would say unless you work it but how do you get how do you dial your vision and how do you get clarity and 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 how do you keep um you know like you said we're only competing against ourselves but how do we keep honing our vision because the best is yet to come for me is you know what if you you want to become known for your goal, okay? Like I'm known for, I became known for the guy that wanted to go to the Olympics. I, even though that nobody thought that I had a prayer, you know, I became known for that crazy luge guy, right? And so why? Because if all you ever think about is that goal, right? Yeah. And, you, and, and, and you create your life uh, to where it'll help you reach that goal, Average people, which is most people out there, and th th those are the ones you don't want to be listening to anyways. They, you know what they call you? Fanatic. You know what fanatic means in, in, in leader talk? It what? means you're focused. You're focused. Yeah. You know what you want to do. These Abandon people it. have no idea. Yeah. You get good. You got to get good at saying no, okay? Because uh, you can't have everything. You got to figure out what you, what's important yeah. to you in life. So wise, yeah. And there's, if, if you're just trying to please everybody and saying yes to everybody, then you're not living for yourself. And then, uh, you know, uh, who was it? Thoreau said, most men live lives of desperate, des uh, what was it, that desperate? <sighs> Come on, you got to help me here. Most men lead one. life I love of, yeah. oh my gosh. Basically, they're desperate inside, but they're, 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 they, they're, they feel lost, right? And you know yeah. what it is? Because they're not, they're, they're not taking the risk to go after their goals and dreams. And then you have a midlife crisis because you have all these unfulfilled dreams and you're trying to, you know, uh, go find a young woman to uh, <laughs> to chase. Right? That always uh, helps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Most guys that, that get into that trouble is because they they never fulfill their they never fill that heart. Here's another thing. It's totally off the subject, but kind of. You have to be willing to approach the person that's the best, the best, the best in your field. Okay. And it, it, well, it, with the internet, it's so easy now, right? But, right? but yeah. oh, but I don't want to waste your time. Yeah. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, impose. No, you're not imposing. As long as your attitude is you're willing to do whatever it takes, as long as it takes, you know, uh, whatever they tell you, because they know they've been there. They've been through that minefield. If you're willing to do what they say, then you're not imposing. Now, if you're going to be the eternal learner, like the college professor that has five PhDs, but never done anything with their life, Right. No, if you're going to be that guy, then don't, don't bug them. You know why? Here's why you, you have to approach them. You know how you always hear, oh, yeah, she's successful, but she's empty inside. Oh, he's successful, but he's always looking for something else. Well, you know why? Because success is the silver medal, okay? Success is the silver medal, right? And you're not there yet, right? You know what the gold medal is? It's called what? significance, okay? Mm -hmm. You know how you get significance? by helping other people yes. succeed, by creating a ripple effect of success. Because now you know you, you made a difference. You can look at them and you made a difference. That makes you, that fills that little hole, okay? Yes. So when you approach that person, they're, they're helping you get that silver medal, you're helping them get that gold medal. Oh it's man, Ruben. symbiosis, baby. Unbelievable, that's beautiful. That, yeah. That's why I have no qualms about calling anybody, anybody. When I, 
started obviously that's how you got that's how you got you you learned that it's such a and you also had to knock on doors as a salesperson i mean i still maintain doing doing cold call sales that'll make you tougher than the than the oh yeah yeah go go work for southwestern books for a while you know yeah uh, i did for <laughs> two like i'd rather go to war than go to sell books yeah oh i awesome. did for two summers and it when, was when every when i run into anybody that worked at southwestern books for more than one summer uh i have I, I have respect they for should it. have medals. Yeah, seriously. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I actually, one of my bosses, when I sold copiers, had done that. And he actually, and I don't know what I did with it. Gosh, but he actually gave me a copy of the manual, which actually showed, okay, when you're going through a street, this is how you go through the streets to maximize everything. I thought, this is gold. It was but gold. Yeah. It is. It is. And, and, and so, don't be afraid. Yeah. You know, when I... You know, cur- I wrote a book called The Courage to Succeed. I believe, and it's not my courage to succeed, okay? It's the courage to succeed. That means everybody's courage, all right? Um, I believe that you got to have two types of courage to reach your dream, okay? You got to have the courage to get started, and everything's hard at the beginning because you don't have any skills, so you have to have the courage to endure, to stay in the game long enough to learn the skills. When I saw the Olympics as a 10-year-old, I thought, that's what I want to do. But I didn't believe it was possible, so I didn't do anything, all right? Uh, now, the curse you get started comes from believing it's possible. If you believe something's possible, hey, I'll give it a shot. Now, the curse you not quit comes from your desire. If you want something badly enough, ain't nothing going to make you quit. That's why I said all those people were quitting the luge. Maybe they didn't want as mu- much right. as me. Right. Maybe they liked the idea of being an Olympian. I want to be an Olympian. And it wasn't for them, about the medals for me, okay? This is crazy. It was not about the medals. It's, I want to be one of the guys. I want to be one of those guys. All right? I just want to be one of those guys, right? It's like, you didn't want to be a five-star general. You just want to be one of those people that got to go to the Air Force Academy, right? Yeah. You, you, isn't that it? You want yeah. to be part of that brotherhood. No. Yeah. I knew I was never political enough or, uh, you know, that wasn't me, but I just, I just, I wanted that. I wanted to be yeah. in, in the, fr- the camaraderie like, of that. Yeah. I, what I miss the most of the, from the luge, it's not the the competition, believe it or not, is not even the Olympics. It's traveling track to track in a stinky old van with a bunch of yeah. other guys who are chasing their dream. That's it's what nice. I miss the most. Yeah. 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 Just hanging around with the guys. Yeah. And so, um, so when I decided, you know, I go to the school, I decided I'm going to be a speaker. I quit my job. We have a one and a half year old daughter. My wife's a full time mom, and I just quit. All of a sudden, got no income and no health insurance. Okay, Mama was not happy that day. Well, but I knew that I could do it. I believed that I believed, and I knew that I could do it. So I was ready to take action. I took action. Well, three months. This is February. The Olympics, March, April, May. I'm speaking at schools all over Houston. Awesome, living the dream. Got my own business and. Uh, it was great, right? Making decent money. I forgot that the summer's going to be slow. School's out, right? June, July, oh August, goodness. nothing. We're $50,000 in credit card debt from the Olympics. And by August, we're three months behind on our house payment. We're yeah. on food stamps yeah. by August. Top of the world at the Olympics in February and humble big time, okay, uh, by August. And that's where I realized, oh, my gosh, I tell everybody to follow a coach or a mentor. I'm not even taking my own advice. I can tell stories, but I don't know how to build this business. I got to find a, a successful speaker. And I found one in Houston. And at first, he wouldn't take me. You know, he says, everybody's an eternal learner. No one's willing to do anything. Forget it. And he made me run, you know, jump through all these hoops. And I jumped through them, you know, in flying colors. And finally, he agreed, right? And yeah. the first thing this guy tells me is, I don't care if you're a 10-time Olympian, unless you write a book, no one's going to take you seriously because an author considers the authority of book, you know, of the subject, you wrote the book on it. He's going on, he's going on so much about it. I thought, this guy must be a publisher. He's trying to sell me. And that's what I was thinking. And he, and he says, just write a book. I said, I can't write a book, man. I made C's in English. I mean, my, my parents celebrated when I came home with a C. And he said, you got a great story. You write it down. We'll get, we get some A students. They clean it up for you. That's just grammar. I thought, oh, my gosh, I didn't think about that. He goes, yeah, it's called editing, all right? So shut up and sit down. Get to writing. Now, that's the beauty of following a mentor. Right. You got all these, all, all, all this fear of the unknown and all this fear of failure, which is what holds everybody back. But the mentor says, piece of cake, do this, this, and this. What's your next problem? So yes. I'd say, clean it up. Yes. They take all this negative stuff and they give you a plan, right? right? And sometimes they give you a kick in the butt, which is what we really need. And so – I write, I start writing this book and I, and I knew, you know, 
I would go to Barnes and Nobles and I look at all the books. I look in my own, my own bookcase. I would look and, and, and I realized, man, I got to get some testimonials. I got to get some other famous people to say nice things about me, right? So you know what I did? I went through my bookcase and I made a list of about 100 top authors to ask them, you know, for a testimonial, right? And I started sending them out. And, and, and I got about 20 big ones. When you go to my website and you go to testimonials, you'll be amazed. I probably have more better testimonials than anybody. Mm-hmm. I got them from Charlie. I got them from, from Zig. I got them from everybody that's a big name in this. And so because you'd expect me to say good things about me, right? But when, when Charlie Tremendous Jones says your book is good and you got to listen to Ruben speak because he's got this, this heart, you know, he's just, a, you know, he's real, he's genuine. But when Charlie Tremendous Jones says that about me, People listen, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. And so right. what did I do? Why am I telling you this story? Because it's what I've been telling you all along. Don't be afraid to call yeah. all the experts. Right. Well, just- the, yeah. And they help you with your vision. I mean, I know where I want to get there. But like you said, the beauty of, and I, I just can't tell leaders enough. Yeah, we're tenacious, but, but there are things we don't know. And even though we have our vision where we want to go, there's going to be other people that, like I said, just one little sentence. Well, that's easy. You just do this. Really? I've been thinking about, I've been struggling this for three years. So, so I love that. Let people help you. They're not going to pull you off your vision, but they're going to give you the, the, the steps, the, the, the techniques, the tools that you got to take because you have to execute your vision. Like you said, what would you call it? The lifelong, the eternal learner. What? You know? Yeah. yeah. And you have different, you know, a, a company, you know, a Fortune 500 company, I bet you they all have board of directors. You know what they are? Just, just very smart people from, from many different industries, and they get together, and they, they think these things out, right? Right. And it's like my dream team. And right. so you have to have a personal board of directors. Right. Mine is a dream team. And right. So, and, and different people for different things, right? right. You know, like, like, like your pastor. My pastor, he's not – in charge of my f- finances. I got a right. finance guy for that, right? I got right. somebody else that, you know, got to write a book, you know, a, 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 experts for everything. Right. right? I and, love it. I love and it. And people like to help. They do. They, they do. do. When they know you're serious about help. And I, I love that. I, and I think our, of the people too that are taking on people, make sure, um, you know, that people really are ready to take what because our time is test very them. valuable. You got to test them. Test them. You know, What's somebody like approaches you. Right. You, you know, at first, when I started, you know, after a while, after a few years of speaking, I started getting, you know, new speakers approaching me, you know, and, and after, at first I wasn't testing them, right? And so they were wasting my time because right. a lot of them like the idea of being a speaker, but they didn't like the reality. And I'd say about once every three months or so, somebody will approach me three or three or four a year. And after a while, I made a list of everything you need to do to be a speaker, right? Because I didn't want to waste time. And I, I don't coach people, right? Right. It's, it's not my thing. It doesn't right. excite me, right? It's just not my deal, right? Life's too short for me. Some mm-hmm. people love to coach. That ain't me. And so I made a list and got to read these books, got to do these things, about a two-year list of things they ought to do to make it happen. And so I'll, I'll meet with them for like this or for coffee or something. I'll tell them stuff and then just, check out the list and then once you've done that stuff let's talk right well i only had three or four that actually went through the whole thing out of about 40 over the years and but these made it right uh so you got to test them you got to see whether at the beginning of i never played football but but this is how it was in soccer it's in every sport the first couple of weeks of football season or any sport coach makes it really really hard a lot of push-ups a lot of man he tries to get everybody to throw up a couple of times right because he wants to know who really wants it who likes the idea of being on the football team and who's willing to do whatever it takes to be on the football team and you know that's what you do yeah so as a leader that. that's what you want to do you want right. to do that to save time right you know if you let's say you have i was in amway for about 10 years Man, talk about a leadership university. It's amazing. Uh, one thing that they would teach is, you know, Amway, if you're a preacher or if you're an Amway, you got to be a really good leader because it's a volunteer army, right? If you're a general, you know, you can send people to the brig if they don't listen to well, you. Absolutely. It's a different type of leadership. Yeah. And so, um, so you have to figure out really quick. Because, look, if you have 100 people in your group, there's probably only 20, there's really probably really closer to 10 that are actually ready to do it, right? Now, the ones that are calling you at 
all the time asking you questions, those are the ones you spend time with. Those are the ones that are hungry. The other ones, you just invite them to the meetings, but they're not ready to take action yet. Let them sit in the system, you know, and learn and incubate. And it'll probably take two years anyway. Sometimes somebody gets in until they actually, you know, wake up and, and they're ready to do it. Yeah. So don't push them. Keep them yeah. in the system. And right. And let them incubate. And they go in as a, they, they joke, they say they go in as a chicken egg and they come out uh, as a, because of our system, they come out as an eagle. <laughs> I love yeah. it. That's yeah. so true. And I so love it. bug you your mentor. Call yeah. them up because that's right. how they know that they right. may be listening to you. Squeaky wheel gets the grease. Right. And I love that you brought out, you know, three or four out of 40. And I always tell people that one in 10. And leaders, you know, not everybody's going to be your perfect follower. You got to find that one in 10 and, and, Cheer and accumulate as many of those as you can to really get the, bo- the best followers because other people are just going to be transacting time for money. Hey, that's okay. That's how a lot of people go through life. But, but if you really want to build that world-class organization that, that's going to pour into you as much as you pour into them, you got to find the creme de la creme that really want it. Yeah. yeah. And don't be afraid, afraid to prune. You know, IBM was, you know, back in the old days, right? IBM, the head of uh, Sometimes you, 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 you read, you know, they, they, they were too mean, you know, every year, like oh, yeah. the bottom 10%, they kick yeah. them out and yeah. the top 10, but they were constantly pruning, you know, I know, I, know. Uh, I was speaking to a group. This was just virtual, right? Just a couple of weeks ago. It was this, um, this association. I'm not going to try to, I'm, I'm not going to say too much because I don't want y'all to know who it is, but there's only like 10,000 associations. So I guess I, I don't right. think you're going to get, <laughs> but I always ask before I'm, going to speak to a group i asked the the leaders you know okay well i need to know two things you know in order to 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 tailor my talk to your group right uh because i'm i'm going all day okay but if, in order to tailor it and you know what's your goal right what's your goal what do you want people thinking and doing after i'm done talking to them now what's the struggle what's holding them back there's got to be there's always something that's holding them sure. back if i know the struggle and the goal and i had to face a lot of struggles and overcome them to reach my goals so i can work it in and, and it works so uh, this association, I asked him that. And he says, well, the goal is, I mean, the, the, the struggle is that um, uh, a lot of them are lost their jobs. You know, a lot of people have lost their jobs, you know, uh, because of COVID. And uh, there's a lot of, um, of uh, a lot of them are feeling guilty. And I thought, hmm, yeah, I guess so. I guess you'd feel guilty if you lost your job and you can't provide, and, you know, especially if you're a guy, you know, so your whole life is wrapped around what you do for a living. So okay, I can get, no, no, no. It's the ones that didn't lose their job. They're feeling guilty. And honestly, I didn't get what they were saying, all right? I, I, yeah. It didn't make sense to my mind. Yeah. So I stewed on it for a while. We talked about it. So the ones, let me get it straight. The, the ones that still have the jobs, are, yeah, survivor guilt. That's what they're feeling. Really? Okay, fine. So I had to t- I actually talk to some of my speaker friends about this, right? What do you think about this? Because I had no clue. Because <laughs> it didn't, you know. It, I don't, uh, if I'm trying to make the soccer team and I didn't get cut, man, I'm partying. I'm so happy that I'm on the team, right? I'm not going to have survivor guilt. That's my competitiveness, right? So it didn't make sense. And so here's what I came up with. I told them, look, look, guys, you always hear that 60% of the people out there hate their job, okay? And why don't they change jobs? Because the, just the I, idea of, of changing the fear of unknown, fear of failure, they'll stick to that job for 40 years because, because they hate it, but it's safe, right? And they're afraid, but the, and they, they, they have that, that desperation, right, that Thoreau talks about, and then they go chasing young women, right, because they're all, you know, they're not happy. <laughs> it's true. And so because they got to, you know, they're, they're unfulfilled. And right. so I said, look, so there's a chance, chances are, 60, at least half of you, you lost your job. That's the best thing that ever happened to you. Right, now you got an right, opportunity right. to find that beautiful job, the one that where you fit in better, right? Yeah. One where you won't be, all right? So look at it as a blessing. You have to, because you have to protect your attitude. Bottom line is you got to protect your attitude. If your attitude goes south, you're dead, all right? Now, if you still have a job, then you need to be grateful, okay? You better be really happy because you still got a job. Chances are you're, you, you like your job. Right. Right. So that's how I told them. What the bottom line is you got to protect your attitude no matter what happens out there. No matter what happens out there. I mean, if COVID goes on for five years and and got to sell this house and end up living in an apartment, fine. That's, but I got to figure out a way to protect my attitude because if I get all, you know, in the dumps about it, then we're really going to be in trouble. It's all an attitude. I love it. The decision. Success is a decision. Right. Decision. Right. 
Uh-huh. You decide you're willing to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes to get the job done. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Excellent. And, and most people, oh, so it's lonely at the top. I don't want to be a leader. Okay. I think that's just a fallacy. Well, I think because other leader, leaders will hang out with other leaders. Right, 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 right. So it's not lonely. Right. There's not just one single leaders. leader in the universe. Like we even get to commune with God and he is the ultimate leader. I mean, so come on, you know, <laughs> what, what's up with that? Yeah. All right. All right. Ruben. Anything yeah. else? Okay. So we covered loneliness, weariness, abandonment, vision, anything else that we have not hit on that you want to share with our uh, tremendous leaders who are just, I'm sure loving all of what you're saying. Uh, no, I think we're good. I, I think we're good. Uh, we, yeah, we, we unpacked a, a lot. Just be hungry. There's, be hungry. Don't yeah. be afraid to ask questions. Yeah. We're going to this church now. Uh, our church kind of shut down for the time being, and they opened up again, but we're really not ready to go into a room with a bunch of you know people that could have COVID. So we're, we've been going to this other church that uh, they're back basically meeting in the parking lot, right? Yeah. And the, the preacher, he's just out on, you know, out by the portico chair, and he's just, you know, doing his thing there, and we're sitting in the parking in, in the cars. And this guy's really good. Okay. Yeah. He, I really like him. Right. And so I asked him, you know, he came by to say hello. And I just started asking him questions. Man, who's some of your favorite preachers, right? Who do you listen to? Right. So I'm asking him about his leaders, by the way, when leaders get together, you know what they're asking themselves all the time? What, what book are you reading? Yeah. I mean, I, we always do that. What right. are you reading? Right. And yeah. We're asking each other for advice and an idea. So I asked him, you know, who, who do you like to listen to? And he said, Chuck Swindoll, and Billy Graham. He says, those two guys are really grounded. And Well, that tells like, you a lot like, about him. Oh, yeah. 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 So I just started watching those guys on YouTube. Right. Yeah. So see, what, see how this works? You know, you ask them, who, who are your leaders? And now you can learn from them, too. Oh, my gosh. Just a, That's brilliant. It's a lifestyle. I love it. I love it, Ruben. And Dad always said that. If you tell me the people that somebody reads, I'll know them better than their own mother knows them. Because that is who really oh, affects I go them. to a house, I go straight to their bookcases. And most of the time, they don't even have bookcases, right? They, they don't. But when they do, in fact, Danny, it's funny. You know what I told Danny when I, he realized we're both Danny uh, Brussel. He's going to be on your show. He is. Soon. He was supposed to be on the show today, but he canceled because he wanted to come over so I can help him with his website. Right. But, and he was busted in your house, Brussell. Danny. We know where you are. He's up here. Yeah he's, he's, yeah, he's pulling his hair up to upstairs <laughs> trying to figure out his website. But Danny Brussel is awesome. Wait, oh my gosh, you are in for a treat. I can't when, wait. When we got started talking about you, he never met your dad. I said, oh my gosh. You know, Charlie, he had about a hundred times as many books as you and I combined. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot. Hundreds but, of thousands. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, incredible. Yeah. It's both. See what we're doing. Leaders are talking to each other about books. Yeah. Cause that's where the knowledge is. You know what? For 20 bucks. Most of the time, a book is about 20 bucks. Okay. Uh-huh. If you're smart, you go to half price book, you get it for two bucks. That's what I do. <laughs> but yeah. I'm a cheapskate. Yeah. More money for more books. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, and to give them away for twenty bucks, you have all the. It's the best deal in the world for twenty oh, bucks. No. The tipping point. I just happened to grab them. You have all the best ideas of that's this person's lives. I know because he's not gonna put the bad stuff in the books. You put the good stuff, right? It's like oh, Napoleon Hill. Okay, cool. You know, or, and it's such a yeah. good deal. It is. You know, it one to I. I don't go to that many seminars. I am so ADD, you know, I'm so restless that I can't sit still. I just, I just can't, right? So seminars don't work for me. They work for some people. I'd rather read a book. But most of the time, the whole seminar is in one book. If you have the, the, the if you can get yourself to take action or get somebody to push you to take action, you don't need to pay 2,000 bucks for a weekend seminar right. for 20 bucks you can get from the book. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and but you got to be the go-getter. You got to go gotta do it. Right. You got to take right. action. And that's good um, because for people that are wondering, because um, my husband has that same thing with, with sitting still and focus, but, but it's how you learn. Some people love to sit there and want to be, dad, love the whole atmosphere and learning, but, but you, you like the book learning. I'm much more like that. I mean, I can sit and listen, but just give me a book and, and I'll, I'll pour into that. But that's good for people to know. Everybody's different. So I said that back to that, know yourself, know, know thyself, yourself, right? Yeah, you can learn either There's way. There's not one way to skin a cat, right? right? There's many ways to skin a cat. So, Absolutely. so you figure out which is your way it's funny one of my coaches this big austrian guy when he whenever you ask him something and and it didn't you know you really do it that way he goes well this is my way 
I love it. Oh, this is my way. There's not a good way, a right way, and a wrong way. This is my way. Love it. Frank Sinatra. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Excellent. So, um, uh, yeah. I mean, we can go on forever, you and I. Yeah. We can go back and forth. We really can. You and I, could, we could, could bring in Danny. We should have a, doc, you know, we we should have a Netflix in, uh, documentary. Other guys. Just, we, yeah. Let's do it. Okay. We can go all day. And, Who are you going to call? You know what's going to happen? You're gonna, <laughs> and you're going to hear the same themes. You're going to hear the same I know. The same principles right. over and over from different people, but maybe you don't connect to me for some reason. Maybe I'm too wild, right? Maybe I talk too fast. Uh, so maybe Danny's your guy. Maybe right. Tracy, right? So it's, it is my way, right? This is your way, it. right? You figure out what, right? right? But you'll learn it. You figure out which biography you're going to read. You're going to still learn the same stuff. Right. Beautiful. Or the same way with finding a place to worship. Why well, I didn't like that guy. Okay, well, there's only 15 gazillion church. Find somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> And they're all full of sinners, too, so you're never going to find them. Yeah. Oh, they're so, such hypocrites. No, they're not hypocrites. They're just yeah. humans. <laughs> well, and Dad would always say that. Well, go on in there. One more won't hurt, you know? Like, <laughs> I was lucky. I know you're perfect. You're, you're, at your, you're, at you're, your dad's you know. place. Stop, stop. I love it. I was it. blessed to spend the night at your dad's place one time. And I stayed in that little guest house. And... It, that place is not luxury, okay? This is a very old little house, probably 100 years old. And uh, the furniture was 100 years old, too. Yeah, you know? Dad did, yeah. But, it's you know, I would rather have spent that, if I had the option, spend that night there or on a tent outside the house, okay, with Charlie in there, and or go to the Ritz-Carlton for a week. Oh, it's a no-brainer for yeah. me. Right? And he took me and he showed me everything and he played the banjo and he – we. Uh, he took me Wait, down to the little Christmas room and he turned everything on. It was, oh, I got it all on tape. It's amazing. And I've never met such a positive person in my life. Yeah. Uh, he had lost his eye already. He knew the cancer was coming and he didn't have long to live, but he, he was the happiest person in any room that he went to. It was amazing. I mean, that was just like unreal. And uh, that's why I wanted to be around him. You know, I wanted some of yeah. that stuff to rub off on me. Well, it sure did. You lucked out. Been, you lucked out. You had him all your life. Oh, man. I mean, what? A, yeah, oh, just what a blessing. But that he poured into so many people and to just keep doing, it's just like he's on a, on a long business trip because now we get to pick it up. And I just think of how he just would be so thrilled. And, you know, we're going to be talking about great books and loving on each other for all eternity. So it's, this is just a temporary <laughs> thing right now, my friend. Hey, yeah, that's right. This is the, this, that's right. It's a prologue. Right. Oh, prologue. Yeah, prologue. Hey, so Ruben, how can people get in touch with you? What's the best way? I guess the easiest way is to go to Ruben, R-U-B-E-N, Ruben Tips, right? There's some good tips, rubentips.com. There's some, some of my most popular um, articles there on, on success, leadership, nice. et cetera. Okay. Test drive them, kick a few wheels, right? And then if you really like them, you know, sign up for the newsletter. Then you get one, one a month or so, or okay. every two weeks, I forget. And there's videos there. There's all kinds of stuff. You know, check me out. See if you want to bring me in to yeah, inspire Yeah, I was going to say, now that you know you're uh, still take, doing all that, who wouldn't? I'll take That's their excuses idiot. away. They walk out thinking, if, if that guy can go to the Olympics, we can do anything. That's my job, just inspire people. Yeah, I sprinkle a little pixie dust everywhere I go. <laughs> I love it. I love your tremendous attitude. Well, Ruben, I just, I can't thank you enough um, for your, your heart, your grit, letting people know. I mean, you drilled right down to, you laid it out, and I just love the way. But in such, like, Dad, such an exuberant way. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and you hug them, and then you kick them, and then you hug them. And, the, and that's, that's, that's what we need. And, and I mean, it's just been a, uh, I'm, I wrote down pages and pages of notes. I'm sure I'll listen <laughs> It's just incredible. And it has been, cool. it's, just, it's been so long since I talked to you. So I'm when just- When are you going to come visit me? Yeah? yeah. You need to come see. There's actually traffic in Colorado Springs now. It's ridiculous. Well, I, same here, but I need to talk too. If your boy wants to get on base for a tour or anything, he probably, if you're so close, he oh, probably- Oh, yeah, yeah, we've been, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, uh, but uh, whatever he needs, if he wants to talk about that, I mean, I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt he'll get in, but you know, you got the prep school, you got all kinds of stuff there. And uh, I went actually to an army school, New Mexico Military Institute, before I got my appointment into- um, Really? In, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, wow. and then it, they were like, you want to go to West Point or Annapolis? And I'm like, that's back East. Right. And they're like, yeah. And I fell in love with New Mexico, Roswell. Mm, it was before the, like aliens, the mountains, before the aliens were there. And so, um, <laughs> so he goes, they're like, well, the Air Force Academy is out West. And I'm like, I want to stay out West. So seriously, that's how it happened. And I was, I like you, I'm like, Ge geography. Yeah, I just want to be here. And then it would turn out to be like the best decision I ever made in my whole life. So, uh, you know, I tell people, I just, I just, you know, but I did not know I had a wonderful air liaison officer, Major John Schaefer. And he was just like, he looked out for me because I didn't even know it was an option. So I just thank you for pouring in all these timeless truths and just taking us through all these different um, aspects of your life. And, and just, I can't wait to see what comes next for you, Ruben. <laughs> me too. I can't wait. <laughs> I don't know if the world can handle it. I don't Thanks. know. Well, we got to work on that documentary uh, <laughs> for Netflix so we could just keep talking about great people and great books. <laughs> Fighting a good fight. There you All go. right. Hey, All right. So great seeing you. Good seeing you too to our tremendous listeners. Thanks so much. If you like what you heard, be sure and hit the subscribe button. Do us the honor of a rating too. And also please share this. Leave us a comment too. We get on there and answer everything. And we've got Ruben's links down there, ours, all that good stuff. So thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for being part of our tremendous tribe. Thanks for paying the price of leadership. And thank you again to Ruben for telling us all that it takes to actually really step into the leadership role. Be blessed, everybody. Thank you for listening to Tremendous Leadership with Dr. Tracy Jones. Find out more about Dr. Jones at www.tremendousleadership.com. If you've been ignited by something you heard in this episode, let us know by leaving a review for Tremendous Leadership wherever you listen to podcasts or by sending us a message through www.tremendousleadership.com.